Literature gives us the opportunity to experience lives, perspectives, and worlds different from our own. Though remember, friend, a good story has many readings, and this is but one. So imagine this. You're the second of five daughters in an upper-class English family, and your mother is obsessed with you marrying a very well-to-do gentleman. Luckily, you've recently met a very well-to-do gentleman. How fortuitous! But then, on the very day he proposes to you, you learn this dude wrecked your sister's engagement because he felt she was too low class. Oh, man. What do you think you'd say to that guy? <laughs> um, well, that's not quite how Elizabeth put it in Pride and Prejudice. I, you know, the novel by Jane Austen. Huh. And here I thought the book was universally acknowledged. Today's literary discussion is brought to you by you, our lovely patrons over at Patreon.com. Thanks so much for the support. So you haven't read Pride and Prejudice? Good gracious, only think, dear me! Well, its protagonists Elizabeth Bennet and Fitzwilliam Darcy are one of the most iconic pairings in all of literature. But what often gets lost in adaptations of this novel is how much of it was intended as satire of 19th century social conventions. So today, we're going to talk about Pride and Prejudice's famous romance, but also about its social and mathematical underpinnings. First up, as Elizabeth Bennet, you probably want to know, why is your upper-class family so cash-poor? Well, basically, Mr. Bennet's property earns enough interest for the family to live on, but not enough to accumulate savings. And this is doubly a problem because your pops has five daughters. Ordinarily, under English law, this estate would be split five ways after his death, leaving each of you without enough money to live on. But it gets worse because the Bennett estate is entailed, meaning it can only be inherited by a male descendant. So when your father eventually dies, you girls get nothing at all, and even the house you live in goes to a cousin you've never met. Plus, as a final irony, the house is called Longbourn, meaning distant limit, which is exactly what you don't have. Your time limit in that house expires when your father does. With this in mind, it's no wonder that your mother, Mrs. Bennett, is kind of obsessed with finding you girls suitably wealthy husbands to ensure you'll be able to live comfortable lives. What sounds like trivial gossip to the men in the novel is literally a matter of life and death for her family. In fact, if we look at Pride and Prejudice's iconic and ironic opening line, the language is suspiciously similar to other major declarations from the Enlightenment. Austin uses this highfalutin language of universal truths for comic effect and to underscore Mrs. Bennett's ridiculous views on courtship. But underneath the laughter is a serious point. For girls like the Bennetts, marriage is the only viable path to economic security. Absurd, but true. Furthermore, a vexing math problem heightens the stakes. There's a man shortage going around, y'all. The novel identifies at least 12 young women in want of a husband, but only five young men in want of wives. And in the background, a war is going on, so any given young man might be picked off by Napoleon before he can pick a wife. So when a rich bachelor, Charles Bingley, moves into town, Mrs. Bennet is full of hope that he'll want to marry her eldest daughter, Jane. Sure enough, Mr. Bingley and Jane meet at a ball and take an instant liking to each other. Yes! But the really important thing here is that you, Elizabeth, meet Mr. Bingley's BFF, the fabulously wealthy Fitzwilliam Darcy. He is haughty and full of pride, which of course leaves you feeling immediately prejudiced against him. In fact, Darcy tells you, to your face, that he won't dance with you because you're not, quote, handsome enough. Ha! <laughs> oh yeah, no. Swipe and left on that guy. Your other suitor, though, is Mr. Collins, none other than that distant cousin who's the heir to your father's estate, and marrying him would prevent your whole family from homelessness. Unfortunately, he's a pompous ass, so when he proposes, you don't think twice about saying no. He ends up marrying your friend Charlotte, who also finds him tedious and awful, but who is relieved to be guaranteed a comfortable future. You, however, are aghast that she'd choose wealth over love. Of course, in Regency England, not every woman had that choice to make. In fact, it's no coincidence that the courtship rituals Austen describes are strictly among the privileged classes to which Austen herself belonged. Like Elizabeth Bennet, Austen belonged to a large, upper-class, but cash-poor family. And also like Elizabeth, she turned down a potentially advantageous marriage proposal because the guy was a colossal bore. As a result, Austin never married and knew firsthand the precarity of being a single woman of little property. And if you want to learn more about how her life influenced her writing, we've got a whole extra history episode on Austin waiting for you once we finish talking about this book. Speaking of, back at Longbourn, things have taken an unfortunate turn. Mr. Bingley breaks off contact with Jane and moves to London. Your sister is heartbroken and you're furious. 
a fury that only increases when you later learn that the pompous Mr. Darcy is the one who convinced Mr. Bingley to avoid a, quote, undesirable match with Jane. Which makes it super awkward when Darcy finds himself falling in love with you. Okay, let's back up. You go to visit Charlotte and her new tedious and awful husband, who works for the haughty and self-absorbed Lady Catherine de Borg, who is Mr. Darcy's cousin, so you end up spending a lot of time socializing with him. But without your embarrassing mother around, Mr. Darcy suddenly notices that you're smart, funny, and actually quite handsome enough to dance with. Then he confesses his newfound love in a marriage proposal that is simultaneously earnest and completely condescending. He admits he finds you irresistible, but it pains him to imagine your mother and sister as in-laws. <sighs> Which, of course, is totally ironic because that's exactly why he encouraged Mr. Bingley to break it off with Jane. So you turn him down and let him have it with the full force of your wit. Darcy is dejected, but his love undiminished. So he starts working behind the scenes to patch things up between Bingley and Jane, who end up married. Not to mention he helps rescue your sister Lydia from the nefarious plans of a local grifter. Furthermore, when you finally visit his estate, Darcy's servants tell you he's kind of a righteous dude. Oh, man. Are you starting to regret your decision without first getting to really know him slash seeing his enormous tastefully furnished and financially secure estate? Maybe. All right. Based on all this new information, what would you say if he proposed again? Exactly. Nice. You both end up deliriously happy in your marriage, and Mrs. Bennet celebrates. And even though we, the reader, were invited to mock Mrs. Bennet's cringy views on marriage, we also celebrate and end up literally on the same page with her about the novel's happy ending. Which, you know, might just make us wonder if all that stuff about universal truths was such an exaggeration after all. Not to mention if we check the math again, of the five eligible bachelors in the book, three have married Bennet daughters, and only one of them was a grifter, so I'd call that a win. As we say in our intro, a good story has many readings, and one of the things that signifies this book's greatness is precisely how many readings it can have. Seriously, getting lost in this one is a must, even if it's just to see which elements you latch onto. Plus, you'll discover why Jane Austen's delightful use of language, rich character development, and cutting humor has earned Pride and Prejudice new fans in every generation. And that is a truth that's universally acknowledged. And speaking of universally acknowledged truths, all of our programming couldn't exist without all of the love and support from our fantastic patrons over on Patreon. Now, if you'd like to join our Patreon community, not only will you be helping us create the content you love, but you'll also have cool options, like suggesting and voting on extra history topics, viewing all of our shows early, accessing our lovely official Discord, snagging some exclusive 4K wallpapers and never-before-seen digital posters, and tons more. Just take a look at the tiers and see what tickles your fancy. But no matter if you want to help forge the future of extra history, join an awesome community, or are just passionate about learning, please consider supporting our channel by clicking the card right up here. And if you do, you'll be joining the awesome ranks of... Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, Kyle Wooldridge, and O'Reels One, who are all fantastic legendary patrons. 